Okay, we can go ahead and get started as folks continue to roll in. Um, again, thank you for being here today. We're discussing innovative treatments for facial paralysis, facial nerve disorders with Dr. Kalpesh Bakaria. He's an associate professor of head and neck surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, chief of facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, and also the director of the University of Maryland Facial Nerve Center. We invite you um, to ask your questions for Dr. Vicaria. You can submit them in the questions or chat function. Um, and at the end of the presentation, he will be available to answer those questions. So if you have um, anything in mind now, you can go ahead and send it in. You can also email it to us at fpi underscore communications at fpi.umaryland.edu. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead, Dr. Vicaria. Well, thanks, Meredith, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, to allow me to talk to you today about some innovative treatments to uh, rebuild your face. Uh, talking about patients uh, that have facial paralysis, some of the new things that we can do. So in terms of disclosures, I have no relevant financial disclosures. I may discuss some non-FDA approved treatment options and some products here. Uh, I did use photos from the literature and I'll give you my references at the end to help demonstrate some of the principles we're going to talk about. And then some patient photos have been uh, used uh, with uh, patient approval. And I encourage people not to take some pictures or share uh, some of the patient photos, please. Uh, and once again, I thank you for joining us. So let's dive right in. So kind of our objectives today, we're going to talk about facial nerve and muscle anatomy to really understand um, the anatomy behind uh, what we see in patients in terms of the paralysis. I'm going to touch it just briefly on patient assessment and I'll focus the majority of the talk on innovative treatment options that are now available to patients. And really the way to summarize that is in the treatment triangle, uh, which, I'll, which I'll be discussing. So before talking about the abnormal in terms of when patients have trouble moving their face, we want to have an understanding of just the normal anatomy. So in general, uh, the facial nerve uh, is uh, comes out of the the uh, within the brain stem. It then enters the temporal bone, which is the bone that encompasses your ear and your sensory uh, organs for hearing and balance. It snakes through this bone, uh, at which point after leaving that bone, it will enter the one of the saliva glands called the parotid gland. Uh, at that point, it will divide to an upper division and a lower division, and then divide further as it makes its way and courses its way uh, toward the center of your face. Now, as we age, or as you can imagine, our facial nerves tend to age with us. So, Dr. Rosen, uh, in 2017, described a very interesting study where he evaluated facial nerve axons in uh, and people of different ages. And he interestingly found that uh, people that are younger tend to have more axons in their facial nerve than people that are older. And so this, this makes sense and it's not such a surprising finding except for the fact that it may explain why some of the nerve-based uh, reanimation or rebuilding techniques that we have work better sometimes in younger individuals compared to older individuals. However, depending on the technique you choose, we can actually get pretty good results in older patients, especially if we start combining techniques. And I'm going to talk about some of these combination of techniques uh, throughout the, the talk today. So we've talked a little bit about the facial nerve, how uh, it uh, comes out of the brain, goes through the ear, and comes into the face. As it makes its way, the ultimate end target is the facial muscles. So now there are about 40 muscles of facial expression. Uh, and the facial nerve, as it divides into its multiple divisions, ultimately uh, supplies uh, electrical input into these uh, facial muscles. Uh, in general, there's a lot of muscles, but you can kind of think of about them as uh, what their goals are. So there, you can kind of divide the muscles as either intended to elevate some structure of the face or depress or uh, uh, drop down a structure of the face. So for example, around the mouth, 
Uh, you're going to have muscles that are located above the corner of the mouth or above the upper lips and muscles that are located below the corner of the mouth and below the lower lips. So as those muscles contract, the goal is so the upper muscles will be, uh, be intended to lift the corner of the mouth or lift the upper lip. So when you smile, you're going to have a lift. Uh, uplift of these structures and the muscles below the goal is to either depress the corner of their mouth and so they help you with more so frown. Similarly in the upper face around the eye you have your forehead muscles and so uh, the goal of this muscle is to help raise your eyebrow just like the muscles below uh, are intended to drop your eyebrow. So patients with facial paralysis tend to miss their smile the most of all of the facial uh, expression deficits that exist. Now there's multiple different ways out there to classify uh, smiles. In general, you can kind of divide smiles as being open mouth smile versus closed mouth smile. I myself, uh, when I pose for a picture, I tend to give a closed mouth smile. However, my wife tends to give an open mouth smile. So it's very particular uh, depending on the different person. Now, Rubin, back in 1974, evaluated 100 people and characterized their smiles in three basic forms uh, and really kind of focused on kind of more open mouth smiles. And he characterized them as 60 in his 100 people he looked at. He found that 67 percent back in the 1970s had what he called a, open, a Mona Lisa smile, where the corners of the mouth get pulled up and the upper lip gets pulled up, just like is shown in Jennifer Aniston here. Uh, where you have more upper uh, dental show. And 31% of people he evaluated had a canine smile. And this is what Kerry Washington is um, demonstrating, where you have some more action of your upper lip elevators, where you'll get more uh, show of your, your canine teeth specifically. And while about only 2% had what's called a full denture smile. And this is where your upper teeth muscle, upper lip muscles really activate and your lower lip muscles activate so that you can see uh, your upper lip, uh, upper teeth as well as your lower teeth. And this tends to happen in only about 2% uh, of people uh, as demonstrated here by Julia Roberts. So now the understanding of the nerve anatomy and the facial anatomy really uh, gives us uh, the ability to now put that together and really recognize that specific nerves, as they innervate specific muscles, work together to create the various facial expressions, as you can see in this chart on the left. And so the different facial expressions that you see, whether it's smile, it's a grimace, it's a frown, it's a surprise look, activate different uh, segments of the nerve, thereby activating different combination of muscles to demonstrate uh, any particular facial expression. So why is this important? So for patients that uh, have facial paralysis, the, many of them will undergo physical therapy. And so a lot of physical therapy is geared toward having the patients understand the different nerves and segments and different muscle segments that are acting together so that they can take what's unconscious and make it conscious. So then now you have the ability to manipulate one's facial muscles in a way to compensate for when muscles aren't working or only partially working. This information is also really important in the operating room. So as surgeons, we use this information when selecting nerve branches, when we're doing nerve-based uh, reanimation techniques to help patients uh, regain some facial function. So we've talked a lot about the anatomy and the anatomy of smile and how it works. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the assessment. And so when you come to the facial nerve center, uh, as uh, physicians here, we're armed with two tasks. And those two tasks are first, determine the underlying etiology of why a facial paralysis may have happened. And then the second task is addressing the facial deficit and treating the patient in the context of their goals and expectations. And then hopefully in doing so, we're trying to minimize the negative psychological impact that facial paralysis has on people. So the symptoms vary according to the etiology. And so I put this chart up here to kind of just hopefully uh, really impress upon the audience that there's a lot of different uh, sources of facial paralysis. And so really step one is really figuring out what is causing the weakness or the paralysis. 
The majority of the time, uh, depending on where you practice, it's usually Bell's palsy. But here at University of Maryland, where we have a very intense uh, facial trauma center as shock trauma, I do see a lot of patients that have paralysis related to various uh, traumatic injury. Also, as part of a big head and neck cancer program here, we also see a lot of patients that have paralysis related to either benign or malignant tumors. So when encountering patients with facial paralysis, uh, in addition to figuring out the etiology, we spend a lot of time uh, figuring out um, how to make the face look and function better. Um, so patients with facial paralysis have been found on numerous studies to have decreased quality of life, report higher rates of depression, and experience a lot of social isolation and stress related to their facial deficit. Uh, and so really we, we are armed with the task in improving their facial function, their appearance, their function, in the hopes to improve the quality of life. Um, the way we do this is by really understanding each patient's goals and uh, in terms of what they're trying to improve upon, uh, whether it's rest symmetry, whether it's voluntary motion symmetry or emotional expression, and whether it's you know re trying to regain some of the control of their facial function that they've lost. Facial function in terms of around their mouth. Patients can have speech and swallow uh, difficulties. Around their nose, people can have uh, nasal obstruction. And then specifically around their eye uh, in terms of tearing and eye lubrication. What makes facial paralysis so exciting in terms of treatment is now compared to, you know, even as much as five to 10 years ago, we have a lot of options of, uh, that are available. It's no longer, oh, I have a paralysis, there's nothing you can be done about it. And we have a lot of options and really we have the ability to tailor the therapies that we have available for any particular patient so we can maximize their function and hopefully improve their quality of life. So when seeing a patient with paralysis, uh, timing is really everything. And so we classify patients further in terms of uh, acute versus chronic. So acute is the patient that just had the paralysis. They woke up yesterday or last week and now all of a sudden their face is not moving. Versus the chronic patient is the patient that's having facial dysfunction for a month or even years. So when I'm seeing patients, I'm asking my question some important questions to myself as I'm getting to know the patient in terms of what's causing the disorder. Also, uh, what is the nerve status? Is the nerve still viable? How long has it been since the nerve has not been uh, being used? And what is the status of the facial muscles that we've just learned about? Um, is the muscle viable? And now if I all of a sudden start driving nerve input in the muscles, is the face gonna start moving? And so these are important questions to ask uh, ourselves because uh, depending on the amount of time that's passed from the paralysis uh, determines what treatment we have available. So in general, the thinking is after 18 to 24 months, if the face has not been moving because of fibrosis and because of scarring, even if you start to drive electrical input through the nerve into the muscles, you're not going to get that much movement. And so really time is muscle. And so our goal is to try to get as much movement back into the face as early as possible. So the other way we classify patients with facial paralysis is we, uh, we think about the paralysis and we classify as in kind of three different forms, the flaccid paralysis, the non-flaccid paralysis, and some mixed type. So the flaccid paralysis is shown on the picture here um, on the left. Uh, where you have a patient that has paralysis of the left side of uh, her face. Uh, this is a patient where the, uh, uh, the left side of the face is completely droopy. And so patients like this will say, oh, it looked like I've had a stroke. They're going to also complain of issues related to function around the eye. This is where you're at really significant risk for the, the cornea of the eye to dry out. Uh, you're going to have some vision loss related to just droopiness of the eyebrow. You'll have some drooling and some oral incompetence, especially when it comes to speech and swallowing problems. Compared to the non-flaccid facial paralysis patient, uh, which is what's shown on the picture on the right. And so in this patient, 
you're actually going to have overactivity in certain areas. You're going to have other areas that have decreased activity. You're going to have tightness in the face. Um, you're going to have narrowing in the eye opening. Sometimes you'll have excessive tearing, and you'll have this entity called synkinesis, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. Now, some patients can have a mixed picture. They can have areas of the face, such as the eyebrow, that are more droopy, which is what you would see in the flaccid patient, versus areas that are more elevated and more tight and more frozen, which is what you'd see in the non-flaccid patient. So synkinesis, which ordinarily is seen in the non-flaccid paralysis, um, is defined as unintentional motion in one area of the face, uh, resulting in, um, uh, in res occurring at, during intentional motion in another area. So the picture on the right shows some arrows. And so when you have a person that's trying to then move their mouth, which is what the intended motion is, you're going to have unintentional motion of the eye. What's shown in the second figure is this gentleman is raising his eyebrows. And so he has the intended motion of raising the eyebrows. You have the unintended motion of lifting the corner of the mouth. So synchinesis develops uh, during the process of nerve recovery or nerve injury. Uh, it's not universal, but it can develop in you know 20 uh, percent of patients, 40 percent of patients, depending on what study you read. Uh, the development of synchinesis usually occurs around two to three to six months after the injury of uh, of the facial nerve. Um, it can be very uh, debilitating aesthetically as well as functionally. And so if you have the uh, what's shown here, the situation where whenever you move you know, one part of the face, such as your mouth or your eyebrows, and you have unintended movement, you can see in this patient when she's uh, puckering or moving her mouth, she's having significant closure of the eye. And so as you can imagine, uh, this can have significant functional co consequences when it comes to your vision. So, when you come to a facial nerve center, you undergo a lot of photos and videos. Um, and so we take this in order to help us educate ourselves and to educate the patients in terms of their progress, in, tr in terms of uh, treatments uh, progress and recovery progress. And so it's, it's periodically, I'll review uh, patients' photos and videos uh, just to kind of get a sense of where we've come and also to get a sense of what treatments we have now at this point that we can improve any particular patient's uh, facial function. So let's switch gears here and talk about more treatment. So as I mentioned, there's kind of two tasks, determining the etiology and directing treatment toward that etiology, but then also what I call the treatment triangle, which is really addressing uh, the functional aesthetic issues that are resulting from the facial weakness or paralysis. Uh, the treatment triangle can be summarized as a combination of medical treatment, physical therapy, or surgical treatment. So medical treatment are uh, things like um, injections, injections of chemo denervation agents or injection of fillers uh, versus surgical treatments, which I'm going to talk about uh, briefly, a subset of treatments that are available to help patients um, in certain situations get more uh, movement of the face in terms of physical therapy, which is a very important uh, uh, branch of that treatment triangle. The current physical therapy techniques incorporate selective exercises of the face, facial massage, and relaxation techniques combined with biofeedback. Neuro, facial and neuromuscular retraining is a type of therapy that physical, physical therapists, uh, especially trained in taking care of patients with phys, facial paralysis, uh, tend to employ. Uh, what is uh, the hope is that through uh, aggressive education and directed exercises with the patients, therapists are able to help patients control their facial movement and compensate for uh, the loss that they may have on one side or the other. And what's been shown in the literature is that this type of therapy actually improves facial function as well as aesthetics. Uh, mirror fire biofeedback is another technique that's very commonly uh, utilized by physical therapists where they use mirrors and ask patients to do various facial exercises to help them regain some control of the face and then ultimately use that uh, those exercises to help improve facial function. 
So let's talk about some medical treatments. So one of the common medical treatments that we deliver at the Facial Nerve Center is injection of dermal fillers. And this is used to enjoy, improve facial symmetry as well as facial function. So my go-to filler is the use of hyaluronic acid fillers. And this is because this is a material that's readily found in people's bodies. So we're injecting uh, agents or medication that is already found in your body. So it's a little bit safer and well, more well tolerated. It also has a lower rate of complications compared to some of the other fillers that are available on the market. Um, now, the other nice part about this is that it's reversible. And so if we don't like the effect, uh, there's a medication that we can give that will uh, reverse some of the uh, effects of the filler. Now, as you can imagine, um, that these, these uh, filler agents are not permanent, and so you will require periodic repeat injections to continue to realize the benefit. So uh, a common treatment that I use for patients that have uh, oral incompetence after facial paralysis is using filler to give some volume into the uh, upper and lower lip. And so in this patient on the left, you can see that uh, when they pucker or purse their lips, they're gonna have a little bit of a gap uh, that exists uh, because of the loss of some of the muscle ability. By putting a filler or hyaluronic acid into the lip, it gives that volume and takes the place of some of the loss, thereby allowing some patients to purse their lips, keep their food or saliva, uh, in their mouths when they're eating or speaking. Other uses of fillers, especially in the patients that are, have the non-flaccid uh, type of facial paralysis, they tend to very deep, very uh, they tend to create very deep uh, smile lines or folds in the area of the paralysis. And so, by using uh, hyaluronic acid fillers, uh, you are able to result in some improved symmetry. Accio Grosso and colleagues recently in 2020 actually described in their paper that dermal fillers in patients with facial paralysis uh, can improve facial symmetry and improve psychological well-being, therefore improve quality of life just after one treatment. Now the other very common medical treatment for patients that have facial paralysis is the use of chemodenervation agents, so such as botulism. Um, botulism, or just in generically speaking, Botox can be given, and it's one of the more common things that's uh, given here at our facial nerve center. And a big part of it is because it's minimally invasive, and it can result in significant improvement in facial function, aesthetic, as well as quality of life. Now, Botox, just to say in layman's term, produces a chemical denervation of muscles by blocking release of a neurotransmitter, the acetylcholine, at the junction between the nerve and the muscle. So now this is a permanent denervation that occurs. However, your body has the ability to regrow these nerve endings between the muscle and the nerve. And so as a result, at about three months, you start uh, developing return of function of these muscles. And so that explains why you have to undergo repeat treatments at times. So Botox is frequently used cosmetically to help soften wrinkles as shown here in this patient where you have forehead wrinkles, you can inject in the forehead and you can soften some of these wrinkles. You can also inject in your 11 lines, which are the lines uh, that end up uh, forming as we age between our eyebrows. So you can see after a uh, standard injection, you can get softening uh, that occurs because you're having, you're having paralysis of these muscles. So these cosmetic indications, these situations, the exact dosing, the location is well, very well described and very generalizable, generalizable across patient to patient. However, in the facial paralysis patient, um, this is not as well generalizable. And so this is where we have an opportunity to really tailor the treatment to any particular patient's facial problem. So let me talk about a couple of the problems that we commonly see. So first is the lower lip. The lower lip asymmetry is very common in patients that have facial paralysis. We can actually inject specific groups of muscle in order to achieve improved facial symmetry and improved function. And so what's shown here in the picture on the, on the right, you have uh, the lack of lower lip pull down with smile in the paralyzed side. So this patient has left-sided lower lip paralysis. And so with specific injections to some of the lower lip depressors, 
you can actually paralyze the non-paralyzed side, then resulting in better symmetry, uh, as shown here, after injection with a very much more symmetric smile and the ability to kind of bring the lips together. The other common area that we see in patients and inject is the platysma. This is the large muscle in the neck that's right underneath the skin. And in general, patients that have non-flaccid paralysis type tend to have a lot of tension, pain, and spasm in this muscle. Uh, that's a very frequent and common complaint at our center. So the muscle also is involved in pulling the corner of the mouth and the lower lip downward. And so injecting Botox, uh, this chemodenervation agent, into the muscle, you can see will relax this muscle, uh, as shown from the picture on the left to the right, where you can see the relaxation of the, the muscle band that's there. What it also tends to do is relieve some of the spasm, the twitching, and the tension, and the pain that uh, patients feel in this area. Additionally, since it's also used to bring some of the lower lip down by paralyzing it, you can actually get some improvement in some patients in, in terms of their smile or uplift of their smile. So synkinesis, we've talked about that, how you have unintended movement of one side of the face while you're moving some other. And so uh, treatment with chemodenervation agents is really one of the gold standards, one of the easiest ways that we have to improve this uh, sequela of facial paralysis. And so as you can see in this patient where you have closure of the, where you have puckering of the mouth results in closure of the eye uh, area uh, with selective uh, specific uh, injections around the eyelid, around the eye, uh, as well as other areas of the face, you can achieve Smile. what's shown Relax. here. Okay. Where now the eye is not closing with that pucker Relax. or with that movement of the, uh, of the mouth. So this is an example of um, a pattern of injections that we will do. Uh, depending on uh, the the problem areas. And so in this particular person that had this map, you know, they had problem areas in the forehead, around the eyes, they wanted some lower lip symmetry. Now, uh, this is not uh, standard between each patient. And so we're armed with the task of figuring out kind of the facial uh, injection map uh, between sessions. And so what's exciting is the patient and I get to know each other, we get to figure out what areas are the problem areas, what areas don't bother them, and we direct uh, injections toward those areas to, to calm down those problem areas. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some surgical options uh, uh, on that treatment triangle that we have that are available for facial dysfunction. So one of the areas, one of the problem areas, especially in patients that have flaccid paralysis, is they have incomplete eye closure. And so this is a, a big problem because uh, if you're not able to close your eye, you're not able to lubricate the eyeball or the cornea, and that's the seeing part of the eye or the colored part of the eye as shown here. Um, if you're not lubricating it, you're kind of putting yourself at risk of uh, drying pain and uh, eventually blindness. And so we take the eye area in patients with facial paralysis exceptionally seriously. And so, Initially, the management is medical management of using things like artificial tears, lacquer room ointment, which is more viscous, taping the eye shut in specific areas, lifting the lower eyelid with tape, or taping the eye shut at night specifically to make sure the eyeball is getting uh, adequate lubrication. All, additionally, we can use things like a moisture chamber, which is shown on the right, which is an alternative to do the, the taping, when you put the moisture chamber, it creates a micro environment where the eye is more uh, moisturized after you put all your drops and lubrication in. So there's an alternative to taping at night. Now, this is what you will see in flaccid paralysis. Close your eyes, relax. Where you can see you don't have the ability to close the eyelid to cover your your eyeball, you also have some uh, droopiness of your lower eyelid as well as the eyebrow itself. All can limit uh, eye function and vision. So in terms of surgical options, um, uh, as we've talked about some medical options, related to the eye area is really implantation 
of these island weights. And so after about a month, if you're still not recovering some of the function around the eye, we would talk about inserting one of these island weights uh, to help uh, with the management of the eye. It's a short surgery that can be done. Uh, it's a come and go, kind of come and go outpatient type procedure, uh, which will allow someone to now be able to uh, volitionally close their eye when they need to. So, for example, in this patient, close your eye. When you ask to close their eye, close you're not able to achieve that. Now, after undergoing eyelid weight implantation into the eyelid, uh, in addition to a brow lift and a lower eyelid lift, you can see what can be achieved. Which is improved eye closure. And so uh, this will help patients. This has been shown in multiple studies to improve quality of life because it's one less thing that the patients have to uh, deal with as they're addressing the rest of their face. Now, a new surgical tool that's been recently added to our armamentarium is called modified selective neurectomy. Uh, and this is can be combined, combined with platysmal excision, which was recently described in 2019 by Baba Kaziza Day uh, out in Los Angeles. Um, this is really a, a nice uh, addition to our, our, our toolbox uh, because for patients that have non-flaccid paralysis, prior to this, we were primarily treating with uh, chemo denervation agents as well as uh, facial dermal fillers. Uh, since the description of the surgery and now really the uh, use of the surgery in patients, it's really helped some improve their facial function, specifically around smiling. Uh, the way this surgery is performed, uh, this is done through a facelift type incision, so it's uh, well hidden incisions. During the procedure, we go in and selectively find nerves that are, uh, are what we call the problem nerves. So these nerves are supplying muscles that are doing actions that they're not intending to do. So for example, when you're trying to smile, you're trying to have your muscles above the corner of your mouth lift the corner of the mouth so you can smile. But there are some nerves and muscles that are now counteracting that uplift. And so as a result, if you can go in and selectively find that nerve and muscle and cut that, you can potentially result in a better smile, better function, decrease in synchinesis. And that's what we've shown here. So let me give you an example. And so this is from his paper. We can see the patient has a kind of lower downturn corner of the mouth, less dental show, and a lot more asymmetry. So after undergoing this modified selective neurectomy, uh, this is what's shown in the bottom, bottom picture is something that can be potentially achieved. And this is in one of my patients that had long-standing facial paralysis, non-flaccid after Bell's palsy. Uh, this is the type of smile that he had. So you can see the asymmetry uh, that's on the left side. He has minimal function. It's more pulling out uh, to the side and very little dental show. So now after this modified selective neurectomy, this is just a couple months out. I take it back a couple weeks out, you can see much more dental show, much more smile. You know, he reports to me that he's felt like for many, many years, over a decade, he's not had a, an appropriate smile. And so after undergoing this procedure, he feels that him and his family kind of see a much more improved and he's happy with the smile that he can achieve. Um, now, the final technique that I'm going to discuss in this talk uh, can be used in patients that have fat, flaccid paralysis. So, for example, after patients that have trauma to the facial nerve, after fractures of the, the, the head or the ear bone, or if a gunshot wound, or after a removal of a tumor, uh, this is where one of the techniques that come in. Also, this can be applied in patients that have uh, a problem that's more longstanding that they haven't gotten recovery of facial function. And so what we do here, what has been described, is the technique of transplanting nerves, so taking nerves from the arm or the leg, uh, and then rerouting them in the face, and then also rerouting local nerves, so specifically the nerve that used to control one of the muscles of biting, so the masseter muscle. You can actually reroute that and reroute it specifically to the nerve branch that controls smile. 
And so by doing this combination therapy, we're actually able to achieve significant improvement in facial function, giving people the ability to smile, which we were not able to do uh, many years ago uh, because of the advances in the technology that's, that's come about. And so this is an example of a person that underwent removal of a cancer and we did some of this combination nerve grafting, taking nerve from the leg, uh, as well as rerouting, taking the nerve from the bite uh, muscle and reconnecting it to the facial nerve. And so this is uh, immediately right after surgery, you can see the paralysis, the lack of movement that is present when the person tries to smile. Now this is four months after surgery. Uh, and we're gonna show you uh, smiling with biting down because that's where the rerouting comes into place. So when you now clench, you're able to smile and then also clenching and smiling um, uh, on, on command. Let's and then show you clench. That. Okay, relax, and then clench and smile. And then relax, smile. That's great. Okay. Relax. Uh, smile. Okay. And so you can see this is a much more meaningful smile that we can achieve, which are techniques because of these new uh, kind of revolutionary nerve-based techniques that we have now, which we didn't even have, uh, you know, five, ten years ago. Okay. And so these are my references. And so I'll conclude. Uh, so understanding the facial nerve and facial muscle anatomy is crucial. Determining uh, the etiology is important because that's a big part of the treatment uh, of the facial paralysis. Remen remembering the treatment triangle, which is a combination of physical therapy, medical therapy, and surgical therapy. And really using combined treatments now can help patients maximize their facial function and ultimately improve their quality of life. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and I appreciate appreciate everyone's attention. And we'll open up the floor for any questions.